In the year 2007, Google secretly entered the beta development stages of a revolutionary new service that changed the way we watch TV. It was known as Google TV Beta. No, not that Google TV or even this Google TV. Google TV Beta allowed you to stream TV shows right from your web browser for completely free. The service was supported by embedded advertisements similar to what we have on YouTube today. It was so secret, in fact, that Google didn't announce it publicly at all. Instead, they revealed the service to a few lucky Gmail users through an Easter egg that was hidden somewhere in the settings menu. Those who were fortunate enough to find it instantly became beta testers of the new service. But it didn't take long for one user to figure out what Google was up to and make a YouTube video showing everyone how to get access to the beta. And this wasn't live TV, this was all on demand. That's right, you could pick out any episode of any show that you want and watch it wherever you want. And the fact that three out of the four major television networks in the US were involved in its early beta stage, mind you, gave the service some major credibility. It wouldn't be long until Google became king of the online streaming world, as once the service was out of beta, it quickly became the most popular way for families across the country to enjoy their favorite shows at any moment. Except, none of that happened. Because Google TV Beta turned out to be a complete hoax, and a very elaborate one at that. And it was only a part of a much larger stunt, a YouTube channel that time forgot. One of the earliest trolling channels on this platform that still fools some people to this day. It's a channel that appears to offer useful tutorial videos, until you realize that every single one of them is a complete joke. And how to sign up for Google TV Beta was one of them. This is the story of the innovative Google product that never was, and the people behind the entire thing. The creators of Infinite Solutions. The Infinite Solutions YouTube channel was created on December 29th, 2006, and the first video was uploaded about a month later in late January 2007. This was the first in what would be a total of 13 videos published on the channel. All but one of these videos appear to be tutorials, a format that is very prevalent here on YouTube and has been for most of the site's existence. In fact, some very large YouTube channels around today got their start making screencast tutorials. These were recordings of a computer desktop, sometimes with a face cam in the corner. But Infinite Solutions videos took things a step further. In addition to a screencast, these videos featured alternating camera shots of the host, background music, as well as an introduction and credit sequence. They follow a script, and the host walks the viewer through the tutorial in a very professional and straightforward manner. They're probably some of the most well-produced tutorial videos from this time. But the thing is, none of these are real tutorials. They definitely look like tutorials, but in reality, the Infinite Solutions YouTube channel is completely satirical. It's one of the earliest channels on this platform to employ the bait and switch technique for fake video tutorials. You've probably seen this technique used in videos before. A more prominent example is How To Basic. At first, the videos appear to be real tutorials. The title and thumbnail entice the viewer with the prospects of learning something new and possibly exciting. But once you click on the video and begin watching, it becomes clear pretty quickly that the entire thing is a joke. Sure, the first 30 seconds or so may seem legitimate, but eventually a visual gag so absurd will play out that makes it impossible for the viewer to leave the video thinking that it was a legitimate tutorial. And most people today know of How To Basics' true nature and don't go to the channel expecting real tutorials. This is the strategy that Infinite Solutions videos use, just not as, shall we say, over the top as How To Basic. 
Each video begins with the host, Mark Erickson, introducing himself. A title card is displayed with a brief introduction sequence before the video cuts back to Mark. It mimics the format of an infomercial or instructional video that you might see on TV. All of the videos follow a similar flow. Mark will begin by explaining the topic of the video, typically a computer issue, and then describe how it can be solved and walk the viewer through that process in a few minutes. The host keeps a straight face throughout, uses a professional tone, and a sophisticated vocabulary, which certainly increases the show's legitimacy. Eventually, however, Mark will make a statement that is completely false or do something that is hilariously absurd that there's no way you can take it seriously. Like in the episode where we're told we can keep produce fresh by, uh, cooking it in a microwave. And what's happening is you're using the microwaves to kill the bacteria that would cause the bananas further deterioration. Yes, and by doing this a couple times each day, we can actually prolong this ripened state by nearly a week. Microwave it even longer, say two to three minutes, and we can even reverse the aging slightly. That's great. There's also an episode called How to Find Dinosaur Bones, where Mark claims to know about the existence of tiny dinosaurs, the fossils of which are so ubiquitous and easy to find that paleontologists aren't interested in them at all. Tiny dinosaur fossils are so abundant, they're not desired by the archaeological community. Most museums have boxes of these bones in storage, but that doesn't mean we can't have some fun learning. All you have to do is go out in your backyard and dig about two feet into the ground. You'll be sure to find one. I recognize this. It's for Grandosaurus Cetatus. One of my favorites is the How to Recharge Batteries episode, where Mark describes a method you can use to recharge alkaline batteries. Just touch the positive terminals together and wrap electrical tape around them. It's called electrical tape because it conducts electricity. Yeah, all of these are hilarious and very easy to figure out that they're a joke. The tech-focused videos, on the other hand, however, can require an understanding of computer hardware and software to pick up on the humor. But some, like the Google TV beta episode, contain no obvious gags or sarcastic remarks, making it even harder for people to tell that it's fake. Though there are a few more things that give away the channel's true purpose. If we take a look at the very first video on the channel, it begins with Mark saying, I'm Mark Erickson and welcome back to Infinite Solutions. Welcome back. That isn't something you'd say in your channel's very first video. The title sequence begins and afterwards, Mark jumps right into the tutorial. No introduction, no explanation as to what the show is about or who Mark is, nothing. This video is called How to Clean Up Your iTunes Library. And if you weren't that tech savvy, it could be very hard to tell that this video is a joke. Mark explains a common problem that you could have with your iTunes library. Having incorrect title, artist, or album information from ripped music CDs or even duplicate songs. He claims to know of a program that can automatically solve this problem. It's called Front End Convert Drop. In reality, it's a basic file conversion tool, but Mark claimed that there's a secret feature that can fix all of these problems with your iTunes library, but for whatever reason, isn't advertised. All you have to do is drag your iTunes Music Library XML file into the program and boom, everything's fixed. Then, supposed before and after screenshots of the songs in iTunes are shown with all of the problems being fixed. Thanks for watching, roll credits. So what was the thing that gave away the video's real purpose? Well, honestly, it's not that obvious, aside from the fact that Mark says a file conversion tool will somehow magically fix your iTunes library. But not everybody's going to know this. In fact, if you go to the download page for the program Mark mentioned, there are a few one-star reviews from around this time period that say things like, I was referred to this program to clean up my iTunes database, but it didn't work. So it's clear that people fell for this, and it's not hard to see why. Because of the way information is presented and the style and flow of the video, it can come across as legitimate. Before we jump into the Google TV episode, I want to briefly discuss the channel's most popular video, as it contains a pretty obvious visual gag. It's called, How to Increase Your Wi-Fi Signal. Most wireless routers only transmit a couple hundred feet, or less depending on interference. The truth is, the latency of these signals travels much farther on the momentum of other networks and radio interference. Your Wi-Fi card doesn't know to extrapolate the router signal from the carrier waves. Your cell phone, however, knows to search for network pings no matter how far it is from the source of signal origin. Coil the Ethernet cable around your phone. The tighter the coiling, the better the signal will carry. To extend your range even further, you can try this. Coat the inside of a salad bowl with aluminum foil. Now suspend the cable-wrapped phone over the center of the bowl. 
And he said it with a straight face. He does all of this with a straight face. How do you increase your Wi-Fi signal? Oh, just wrap an Ethernet cable around your cell phone and tape it to a salad bowl. Yep, you've made a satellite dish. That's how DirecTV works, ladies and gentlemen. Look, this is so obvious to someone who knows how networking and Ethernet cables work. Even somebody who isn't an expert knows that wrapping an Ethernet cable around your phone isn't going to do anything, other than make it very difficult to use your phone, of course. Hi, I'm Michael MJD, and welcome back to Numberless Fixes. Remember the last time I did a sponsorship for Skillshare and everyone was bragging about how they got a free trial of Skillshare Premium? Well, if you missed out, here's your opportunity to get in on a new offer from today's video sponsor. Skillshare is always looking for new ways to get people to use their site. That's why they've hidden a link at the very top of this video's description. The first 1,000 people who find it can get access to a free trial of Skillshare's Premium Membership. What is that, you may ask? Do you really not know about this already? Okay, it's a way for you to get access to thousands of classes so you can learn all sorts of new skills or brush up on something you already know. Perhaps you wanna make the next Google TV hoax that'll fool even more people. Maybe you can call it uh, Apple TV Plus. Oh wait, that's that's already a thing. I mean, it might as well be a joke. Well, you're gonna have to be pretty comfortable with video editing and HTML, and Skillshare can help you do just that. Oh, and hey, remember that MKBHD guy that I mentioned earlier in the video? Yeah, you might have heard of him. Well, it turns out he has his own Skillshare class now, and it's all about achieving YouTube success. And what better person to learn from than a guy who has more than 14 million subscribers and over a decade of experience? The great thing about Skillshare is it's specifically tailored to learning. Every class is broken up into multiple segments for more convenient viewing, and it's completely ad-free. And their collection is ever-expanding, with new classes being added all the time. So if you were one of the lucky ones who found that link hidden at the very top of this video's description, be sure to click on it, and if you're one of the first 1,000 people to do so, you'll get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. I hope you found this information interesting. I'm Michael MJD, and this has been Numberless Fixes. I could spend the rest of this video talking about the absolute absurdity of this channel, but not all of the videos on it have such an obvious indication that they're a joke. So let's focus on the second video ever uploaded to it. How to sign up for Google TV Beta. This video, along with the first, third, fourth, and fifth video on the channel, were uploaded on the very same day, January 26th, 2007. Just like the others, it appears at first glance to be a legitimate tutorial video. Mark begins by talking about a new service that Google is secretly working on, an on-demand, free-to-watch television platform, and that they have hidden an invite to it within Gmail. He legitimizes this by explaining that this practice is nothing new for Google, as they have hidden Easter eggs in their products before. He goes on to compare the beta invite to Google TV to that of Gmail. Remember when Google introduced the now commonplace Gmail address and everyone was bragging about the two gigs of storage and the message searchability, but you couldn't get Gmail without an invite? Well, here's your opportunity to get in early on a new Google Labs beta product. Google engineers have a history of Easter egging their sites. You might know about the LeetSpeak Google or the Numerological Challenge sites, or how about Loco Google? By the way, it's worth noting that not all of these are official Google sites. This is a common scheme among Infinite Solutions videos. Mark will often compare whatever he's talking about to a real thing that actually exists, and attempt to station it as the next incarnation of said thing. Oh, well Google's done this before with these three websites, so why wouldn't this be real? We can also see this in the How to Speed Up Your Mail Delivery episode, where he compares the LPC code, which doesn't exist, to the zip code, which does. The U.S. Postal Service is constantly workshopping methods to upscale throughput while remaining affordable. In 1963, the Postal Service introduced the five-digit zip code. In 1983, they expanded to plus four codes. But on October 1, 2003, the USPS introduced the LPC code, seen here. This seven-digit code allows mail to bypass the local processing center step in the distribution chain. It's very cleverly laid out. And this, combined with the format and style of the video, can really increase its legitimacy to the viewer. So how could you get an invite to Google TV Beta? Log into your address, go into the Settings tab, then to the General tab within that. 
At the very bottom, you should see Love Gmail in bold, with a link directing you to other Google products. Right click and select Copy Shortcut. Now go back into the main screen and send yourself an email with a link location pasted in both the subject and body of the email. Be sure not to hit the space bar before or after pasting the link, because if there's an added character, this won't work. Archive the letter, and log out of Gmail. Log back in again, and note the envelope M. It may or may not have a rollover animation. Google uses a random number generator to enable the Easter egg based on the number of times you've logged in after emailing the link. If a rollover is not activated, log out of Gmail then log back in again until you see the Google TV activator. Here it took me 11 times. Finally. This video went viral soon after it was released. One day after the video went live, it was sitting at 13,000 views. But a week later, it had jumped to over 200,000 views. And keep in mind, this was on a channel that was created just over a month prior. That's an extremely impressive achievement even today, but especially in 2007. Obviously, everything you're seeing in the video is made up. This doesn't do anything. There's no hidden invite because the service doesn't exist. So that means the screencast portions of this video, where you see Mark mousing over the Gmail logo, receiving the invite email, and clicking on a show to watch, are all fake. But it's pretty hard to tell this because the people behind this hoax considered everything to make it appear legitimate. The Google TV homepage shown in the video appears to look like a real part of Google's site. It has a similar layout. The email address tied to your Google account is at the top right. The design of the Google TV logo isn't unreasonable. I mean, the spacing is a little too close, but you wouldn't notice that if you weren't actively looking for it. And the way the entire service is paid for ties right in with how Google makes money. Advertising. You can call up any current TV shows or TV shows from network libraries for free. You watch them streaming and they're embedded with ads based on keywords found by Google bots in your cache and email history. My email is littered with tech terms, hence the ATI ad here. But there are a couple of places where they slipped up. I want you to look closely at Internet Explorer's title bar and the label on both the opened tab and the taskbar button in this clip. Notice anything off? Yeah, they're not all the same. The title bar and the taskbar button say, Welcome to Google TV, but the tab says, Google TV, Welcome. This is not how web page titles behave. It should look like this clip when Mark is logged into Gmail. Notice that all three of the labels are exactly the same, with the exception of the Windows Internet Explorer text missing on the tab label. That's not going to be there, but the title of the web page will, and it should be the same as what we see in the title bar and taskbar. Also, take a look at when the shot changes from a recording of the computer screen to Mark. And log out of Gmail. Log back in again. When we see the computer screen, the browser window is maximized, and the taskbar and system tray are present. But when the shot changes, the screen has the browser window off-centered to the left, with the Bliss wallpaper visible. So these clips were obviously recorded separately, but that could have been done for a legitimate purpose. One other thing I want to touch on is the email that Mark receives with the supposed invite to Google TV. It looks pretty convincing, it describes what the service is, and there are even ads on the right side of the email relating to TV services. But when Mark scrolls to the bottom of the email, you'll notice a couple discrepancies. It's hard to make out, but the link given at the bottom appears to say mail.google.com, which isn't the URL you would use to access Google TV. It's also signed with the Gmail team. So this pretty much confirms that this message had its HTML code modified, which is very simple to do. You can do this right now by right-clicking on the page and selecting Inspect or Inspect Element. My guess is they just forgot to change these two references to Gmail at the bottom. Now, what about the segments where we see the Google TV page itself? The browser appears to be navigated to tv.google.com, so it must be real, right? Well, no, this is incredibly easy to fake. You can just navigate to any web page you want, erase what's in the address bar, and type in tv.google.com. But what about the status bar? You can see here that it displays tv.google.com while the page is loading, though it is kind of hard to make out. How are they doing that? 
Well, again, this is very simple to do. By modifying your system's hosts file stored in System32, you can forcibly map a specific IP address to a host name, which can be tv.google.com. So they could have just set up a local web server, made a few HTML documents, modified the hosts file, and boom, you've got Google TV beta. Going this route also means that you don't have to manually change the text in the address bar. But this could also have been accomplished through some clever video editing and or After Effects work. This would explain the fact that the tab title is different from the taskbar button and title bar text, which could have been something they overlooked while editing the video. Or it could be a combination of all three. Regardless, it looks very convincing. At least at first glance. Because if you were to try and go directly to this URL, as some people did, your browser would return a cannot find server error because it doesn't exist. Some people even looked at Google's DNS info and sure enough, a record for the TV subdomain doesn't exist. But not everyone's going to try all of this. As I said before, this went viral when it was uploaded to YouTube, which led to a lot of people logging out of and logging back into their Gmail accounts over and over again, hoping that the Gmail logo will have the rollover animation. But this did nothing but waste their time. And the more people that tried this over and over again, the more people became skeptical of the video's legitimacy. But one of the things that surprised me about the Infinite Solutions team is the level that they went to to try and dispel these concerns. It's one thing for a prank channel to upload one hoax video and leave it at that. But two days after the first Google TV video went up, the channel published another video called Update Google TV Beta. It opens with a much shorter title card and is shot in a more off-the-cuff style. Mark addresses the rumors of Infinite Solutions being a hoax, denies them, and proceeds to discuss the comments saying that they were having trouble getting the rollover animation to work. Mark chalks up the issue to Google making it more difficult to get access to Google TV after discovering his video. Which, when you think about it, doesn't make any sense for a beta program. I mean, why would you make it harder for people to sign up? That would result in fewer beta testers. In fact, why even make the way for people to get access to your beta testing program so convoluted that it takes people hours to figure out? But the interesting thing about this video is how Mark demos Google TV running on his computer. And there are a few things I want to point out. So let's roll the tape. I'm more concerned by the allegations that this is a hoax and that Infinite Solutions is some type of a joke. I assure you it's not, and to prove it, I'm gonna show you Google TV running on this computer. I'm gonna do this without any editing, without any screen caps, I'm gonna go nice and slow, one shot, so you can see this is not. Did you notice the delay there? Open Internet Explorer, go to Gmail, I'm gonna log in, it's Mark Erickson. Okay, so did you see the username field? Here, I'll play it again. I'm gonna log in. It's Mark Erickson. Part of his username auto-populates when he types only one or two characters. Type in my password. Okay, why would you record the keyboard when typing a password? Oops. Okay, my bad. So he types his password wrong, apparently. Now, for those of you familiar with the interface, you'll know that the TV link is going to be at the top of the page, next to Docs and Spreadsheets. There it is, next to Groups, I'm sorry. And here we see some more HTML edits. This TV link never existed in the navigation bar, meaning that it had to have been added by modifying the page's HTML code. On top of that, check out what happens when the page opens up. I'll click it, and here we are. The tab and title bar now display the URL of the page, rather than the title we saw before. Now this happens when an HTML document doesn't make use of the title tag, which leads me back to the theory of this being a real HTML document hosted on a local web server. This time around they just forgot to add the title tag to it. And while we're here, I want you to listen closely to Mark's mouse clicks. Go to NBC, primetime, pull up an episode of Heroes, season one. Doesn't that seem a little out of sync? Now sure, this could just be slow performance, maybe this is an old computer, but this combined with the TV link already being in the navbar when Gmail finished loading, 
makes me think that what you're seeing is actually an already rendered video just being played back in full screen on the computer. If true, Mark's keyboard and mouse likely aren't even plugged into anything, allowing him to try and line up his mouse clicks and key presses with the video without affecting its playback. This would also explain the weird auto-population of part of his email address, which could be a cut between two clips and editing, or the person in the video just typing it faster than Mark. It could also mean that Mark typing his password in incorrectly was done intentionally, to give the video some more realism. Now, it would certainly help if the video was a static shot of the computer monitor with the keyboard and mouse in frame, like we see at the start. But it isn't. The camera operator pans and zooms a lot, and moves away from the screen entirely at certain points, almost like it was intentional, so as to make it more difficult to notice any mistakes or inaccuracies. Later on, he waves his hand in front of the screen to prove that the monitor isn't masked with a video in post-production. Oh, and by the way, have you noticed the cell phone wrapped in an Ethernet cable on the table? This is one of the other things I love about this channel. The people behind it have essentially created a universe in which the Infinite Solutions videos exist, and they will often make references to other episodes. This clearly being a reference to the How to Increase Your Wi-Fi Signal episode. The Recharging Batteries episode features a large Minesweeper board opened up on the computer in the background, which is a reference to the Hidden Minesweeper Mode episode, where Mark shows you how to gain access to a secret mode in the game, which, shocker, doesn't actually exist. And speaking of Mark, you may have already guessed it, but that isn't his real name. Mark Erickson is simply a character played by one of the co-founders of Fatal Farm, the production company behind the show. We can see this listed in the end credits for every single episode. And they went to great lengths to try and keep the Google TV hoax believable. One day before this video was published, a video response, remember those things, from the user GC91660 was added to the original Google TV beta video. In it, a seemingly random user showcases the Google TV beta page opened up in Firefox on a MacBook. I got it on my 114th login. Yeah, so this is also a joke video created by Fatal Farm to make Google TV seem even more real. However, there are some major red flags. For one, the channel was created on the very same day that this video was uploaded. And to this day, it is the only video on the channel. So don't be fooled, this isn't just some random guy, it's actually the other co-founder of Fatal Farm who would eventually go on to play John Arbuckle in a more popular web series from the company known as Lasagna Cat, a parody of Garfield featuring live-action recreations of various Garfield prints before transitioning to a bizarre music video that incorporates the narrative from the comic strip in some way, sometimes with a very mature theme. And in doing so, the videos provide an ironic commentary on the style of humor used in Garfield, the channel has had two short bursts of video uploads throughout its life. The first being in January 2008, when the first 20 episodes were uploaded all on the same day. And then, nine years later in 2017, when the next 13 were published. Though there was some hesitancy from the producers about reviving the series. I felt kind of bad re revisiting it and releasing it because I don't think it's fair for a, an adult to attack a cartoon that's used to like encourage children to read. <laughs> like not every comic strip has to be Calvin and Hobbes, you know? That was part of an interview with Zachary Johnson and Jeffrey Max, the co-founders of Fatal Farm. Zach plays Mark Erickson in the Infinite Solutions videos, and Jeffrey plays John Arbuckle in Lasagna Cat, and the, hey look, I got Google TV to work guy in that totally not affiliated with Fatal Farm video. Both of their real names are actually credited in the Infinite Solutions videos under production assistance. After Lasagna Cat took off, some commenters made the connection between the two Two shows, with one user commenting on the Google TV Works Proof video and saying, This is the guy from the Lasagna Cat and Fatal Farm videos, and they're connected to the Infinite Solutions videos, so this one's a hoax too. Just like that, another layer is added onto the prank. And you gotta give these people props for thinking of this many ways to keep the ruse alive. Now you might say, 
What's the point in doing all this? Going to these lengths to try and make this appear legit, when all someone had to do to discover the true nature of Infinite Solutions was to look at the other videos on the channel, the ones that are so obviously satirical. But keep in mind, when this video went up, the channel only had five videos on it, four of which are not abundantly clear to be joke videos. They all are, but they don't have a large visual gag that practically everybody can pick up on. Unlike the How to Increase Your Wi-Fi Signal episode, which is the only one with a blatantly obvious visual gag. Later on though, the channel uploaded the How to Recharge Your Batteries video, the How to Keep Your Produce Fresh video, and the How to Visit New York City on $100 video, which are all very clearly joke videos. However, the channel's true nature wasn't so universally clear initially, which makes reading the video's comments from around this time hilarious. Because you have people that figured this whole thing out, watched the Wi-Fi signal video, found it odd that all of these videos were uploaded in the same 24-hour period, and came to the conclusion that the entire channel is a joke, but then went along with it and posted things like, it totally works, they just forgot to mention you have to disable cookies, that's it, it's so cool. Then you had people who were legitimately angry when they discovered the channel was fake, probably because they wasted so much time logging in and out of Gmail. You even had some people make video responses to the Google TV video calling Infinite Solutions out for being a hoax. Like this one from three days after the original video went up, where the uploader points out the difference in the tab title across the three videos, which should not be the case. And then you had people who commented on this video trying to mess with the uploader. Look buddy, just because you couldn't get an invite doesn't mean it's a hoax, I've been using it all week now. But YouTube commenters weren't the only people who got fooled. Let me introduce you to this Gizmodo article from the day the video went up, where the author expresses skepticism over the video's legitimacy, but admits that they've been trying despite our better judgment to no avail. Later on though, they figured out that the video was a hoax. But it didn't stop at Gizmodo, not by a long shot. The Infinite Solutions is the first time we had like true virality, and that was really exciting. I had a friend that um, whose roommate actually worked at Microsoft at the time, <laughs> and they had an emergency meeting at Microsoft the morning that that came out to, to talk about what they were going to do for Google TV because it wasn't on their radar at all. And my friend's roommate had to explain to them that it was all a hoax. And yeah. that was, that Google was had, to, had to release press statements and, and address it because people were contacting them about it. So that's the story of Infinite Solutions and the Google TV beta hoax that tricked thousands of people and a multi-billion dollar multinational corporation. Ever since then, the channel has been inactive and it hasn't been uploaded to in almost 14 years. But that hasn't stopped it from gaining a bit of a cult following. With that occasional Reddit post that renews interest in the videos, and those people that return every so often to revisit the old days of YouTube. So if this is your first time hearing about Infinite Solutions, be sure to go check it out. Just don't try to log in and out of your Google account 700 times. That's all for today's episode. I want to thank you all very much for watching. If you enjoyed this one, be sure to give it a like and get subscribed. And as always, I will see you all in the next video.